Good afternoon. Welcome to today's presentation, Substance Use Disorder in Pregnancy. This webinar series is made possible by a grant award from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. We are excited to provide this virtual series during the month of September, which is National Recovery Month. Today's session is being recorded and will be uploaded to the CMH YouTube channel for future reference. Please feel free to use the chat box to ask questions and add comments you have at any time throughout the webinar. And if time allows, we'll do our best to answer as many as we can at the end of this presentation. Our presenter today is Dr. Janice Romanik. Dr. Romanik is the Medical Director of Sacred Heart Rehabilitation Center. She completed her undergraduate at Oakland University and obtained her medical degree at Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine in East Lansing. She went on to complete her residency at Henry Ford Macomb Hospital in Clinton Township. She is board certified in both family medicine and addiction medicine by the American Board of Osteopathic Family Physicians, which includes her CAQ in addiction medicine and the American Board of Addiction mm -hmm. Medicine. Dr. Romanik is an established physician in the field of addiction medicine and is an advocate for the use of medications for opioid use disorder. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenter. I'm going to be talking about substance use disorder and pregnancy. And I, I have no conflicts of interest or disclosures relevant to the content, uh, content of this presentation. So what we're going to start with is some unique considerations for pregnant patients. Um, what we see is we see higher rates of domestic violence in individuals abusing substances while they're pregnant. Um, individuals who are pregnant and using substances, they have a, have a tendency to not want to come into treatment because they have a fear of CPS intervention and also child welfare implications. Um, a lot of them have child care issues. This might not be their first pregnancy and they have other children that they need to um, take care of while they're in treatment. So they do have issues having child care while they're in treatment. There's a high level of stigma associated with abusing substances during pregnancy. So in individuals who are abusing them have high levels of shame or guilt, and they are less likely to come into treatment because it makes them extremely nervous that they will feel that shame or guilt or be judged um, because they are using it. Um, some of them have transportation issues, so they have problems getting from point A to point B. So some of them have employment issues or financial concerns during their pregnancy. And they typically have a delayed realization that they're pregnant. So a lot of times they have irregular menses due to their uh, drug usage. So they don't realize they're pregnant until later on in the pregnancy. Um, so with that delayed realization of pregnancy, they might get into treatment later um, than they would normally. And they'll also have a delay in um, prenatal care. Some common, common characteristics we see in individuals who are pregnant abusing substances, they tend to be younger they're emotionally labile or they are easily overwhelmed by small things. Um, the good thing is they're really highly motivated to change. So maybe they were kind of on the, they weren't um, ready to commit and all of a sudden they find out they're pregnant. Well, now they realize is a time to start change. So they're more likely and highly motivated to make that change. And you see a less, they're less ambivalent about that willingness to make that change. Um, one interesting thing we see in females over males is we see a shorter progression of the disease. Um, so what does that mean? It's also known as a kindling effect. So women typically exhibit faster onset and progression of their substance use disorder after their first exposure to substances. And they also experience greater impairments in social functioning. So what does that mean if, if an individual who's male will develop their usage over three years till it gets heavy and to become a problem after their first exposure to the substance, a woman might actually use that substance for the first time and they might become um, addicted to it um, over the next year and um, they're, they're relying on that. So where a man might be three years, a woman's one year and it's a kindling effect we see in women. And then individuals who are pregnant also have um, family support. So a common characteristic is typically when they didn't, families didn't want to help their loved ones um, because they've done it too many times and they were kind of withdrawing. When the pregnant or when the patient um, discloses that they're pregnant, they're more likely to have that family support um, for them to enter treatment. What is the prevalence in pregnancy? So past month substance use disorder. So this is according to the National Su Survey on Drug Use and Health. Um, there was an illicit drug use that increased in pregnancy from 
percent in 2019, and it did increase from 5.4% in 2018. So it went from 5.4 to 5.8%. Um, I don't have the 2020 data. So for the NSDUH, National Survey of Drug Use and Health, um, they don't release their data till the end of this month, beginning of next month. So it should be released very soon. And that should be interesting to see how individuals um, with during pregnancy, um, how their treatment went during um, the coronavirus pandemic. So what about alcohol use in pregnancy? So now we're going to look at each one individually. So the National Survey Drug Use and Health they showed an overall decrease. So it went from 9.9% in 2018 to 9.5% in 2019. And then in the 18 and 25 year olds, it actually increased from 11.2% to 13.8%. But in the 26 to 44 year olds, it decreased from 9.5% to 7.7%. And one trend you'll see is they do break it down based on trimester, first, second, and third trimester during the pregnancy. And with all the substances that I'm going to talk about today, you'll notice that during the first trimester, there is high, high use. During the third trimester, there's a significant decrease. So as they find out they're pregnant and enter treatment, you'll see a drop um, between the first and third trimester in, with all the substances I talk about today. So there was uh, actually a slight uptick in the first trimester from 21% from to 21.8%. And then if you look at the third trimester, it went from 3.6% down to 3.4%. So if you look at the first trimester of 21.8% down to the third trimester of 3.4%, you notice a significant decrease. So I do want to talk about the infants that are born to mothers who are abusing alcohol, so the fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So this encompasses a broad range of effects and symptoms based on prenatal alcohol exposure. Um, typically, it's underdiagnosed. So anywhere from 92 to 95%, um, if not more, are very, very minor. Um, it's, you don't notice necessarily the fetal alcohol syndrome, the common one when we think of it with the short stature and the facial changes. Um, for these, the, it's a large spectrum, and a lot of the individuals um, only show patterns of behavior, and that's what we need to look for in a lot of individuals. So it's underdiagnosed because you don't see these, um, these other developmental disorders. They're more likely to suffer from mental health disorders, so ADHD, depression, anxiety, impulse control is a really large one that we see um, problems with. So some of the neurodevelopmental disabilities, the cognitive impairments and behavioral impairments that we see, they have issues with communicating and socializing with their peers. They have problems controlling emotions and impulsivity. So this is, um, they misinterpret intentions. So I use the um, example of hit others. So it's the child in you know, first or second grade who doesn't know how to communicate with their peers and um, they're really impulsive. So instead of you know, processing what their peer says, they automatically hit their peers um, over something that really doesn't need to be um, a, an, an attack of any sorts. Um, they have issues with learning and remembering. So you see an increase in learning disabilities. They cannot recall information very well. Um, you'll see some issues with performing daily life skills. So feeding, bathing, those are more for the more severe forms of fetal alcohol in the spectrum. Um, money and time telling you see too with the more with the less um, ones. So they have issues with numbers. So telling time is very problematic, counting money, anything that has to do with numbers, you'll see them struggling with. Um, they have difficulty minding their personal safety, so they have problems perceiving danger. So this will be the child on the playground who, when they're on a really high structure and the kids are all telling, you know, you jump, no, you jump, and no one's really doing it. This is the child who will not even pause and just jump off that structure. So you might see um, this, this child coming in more for broken bones than um than their peers or you know um, other type of injuries. They have problems with shifting attention and that's that overlap where they might they are more likely to be diagnosed from other mental health disorders, the ADHD, um, because they have issues with concentration. When we talk about fetal alcohol syndrome, this is only two to five percent of the live births in the US. So this is the severe form. This is the one we always think about um, how the picture we have of a child who's been um, born to an individual abusing alcohol, but really this is a small percentages of the births. The other ones are much um, less severe. You don't see any of the features. Um, so with these children, the more severe ones, you do see evidence of the um, um, CNS, the 
abnormalities, you see it's typical like gross deficients. They're very short stature and they have these abnormal facial features. So they have these really narrow eye openings. They have a flat mid face, kind of a smooth area between their lip and nose, along with this very thin upper lip. Um, you'll see epicanthal folds and potentially railroad track ears, which is like a notching. And you also see, see a smaller than normal head and underdeveloped jaw. So it's a real common feature of fetal alcohol syndrome. But yet again, this is um, in less of the population than the fetal spectrum disorder. For tobacco use in pregnancy, we saw an overall decrease from 11.6% in 2018 to 9.6% in 2019. In the 18 to 25 year olds, this was decreased from 18.5 to 13.4% in the year past. In the 26 to 44 year olds, it decreased from 88.9% to 7.9%. And yet again, you see in the first trimester where it might be very high at 14.5%. Um, in the third trimester, it's decreased to 7.5%. So the longer an individual um, progresses through their pregnancy, the more likely they are to quit um, because they are pregnant. So tobacco use in pregnancy, it, it remains the most important modifiable cause of poor pregnancy outcomes in the United States. So what we've seen is that quitting smoking before 15 weeks of gestation, it typically yields the greatest benefit for the infant. Um, but smoking cessation before the third trimester can eliminate some of the birth reductions that we see in there, or the reductions in birth weight that we see. Um, some of the other adverse effects, you have the intrauterine growth restriction, you have placental abruption, which is when the placenta will tear apart from the uterus, um, and that requires immediate birth. Um, you'll see a placenta previa, and that's where the placenta overlies part of the cervix. So these women are more likely to have a breakthrough bleeding, like some spotting and bleeding during their pregnancy. And um, more, it's more difficult during delivery, um, depending on the percentage of the placenta that's overlying the cervix. You'll see a preterm premature rupture of their membranes. And then you see that again, the low birth weights that they can reduce if they are able to quit. So what about infants um, who are exposed to tobacco in utero? So they have a higher risk of preterm delivery and prematurity. It's five to eight point percent higher than the general population. Um, they have higher incidence of SIDS by 23 to 34 um, percent. They have that reduction in birth weight to thir by 13 to 19 percent um, compared to the general population. You'll see preterm deaths, so stillborns, that, that's five point five to 7%. So that's actually 1.8 to 2.8 greater risk than non-smokers. And then for the childhood risk, what we see is an increase in asthma. We see an increase in infantile colic and childhood obesity of um, infants whose mom smoked. Smoking during pregnancy. Um, so if we look at um, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, their division of vital records, this is from 2019 also, it was released in March of this year. Um, it shows that the American Indian population had the highest um, incidence of smoking during pregnancy at 34% um, of their population were smoking. So um, American Indians are the highest. For marijuana use in pregnancy, the National Survey and Drug Use and health has shown an overall slight increase in the past month of marijuana use in pregnancy from 4.7% up to 5.4% in 2019, and a slight increase in daily and almost daily marijuana use in pregnancy. Um, one thing to note is where the question is, is you know, now that more states are legalizing marijuana, there's this, perceive, there's this perception by the general public that if it's legalized, it must be safe during pregnancy. So, um, you might see more individuals using marijuana than previous, um, but it just depends. The 18 to 25 year olds, you saw a decrease risk from 9.8 to 9.1%, and the 26 to 44 year olds, it increased from 2.7% to 3.5%. And yet again, if you look at the trimesters from the first trimester, where it was 10.5% or 9.1% in 2019, to the third trimester, you saw that decrease to 3.3% in 2019. So, yet again, as they're as their pregnancy progresses, they're more likely to decrease using marijuana or discontinue using marijuana. Marijuana use in pregnancy. So women, any woman contemplating pregnancy, they need to be encouraged to discontinue their use. 
Um, and that's the same with tobacco and alcohol, but we wanna to talk to them um, about regular use and not using regularly. Women using marijuana weekly or more, especially during the first and second trimester are at an increased risk of smaller birth lengths and head circumference, lower birth weights. Um, they have an increased risk, we believe, of preterm birth. So some of these um, you have to interpret with caution. So a lot of times they could not adjust for tobacco use in these studies. Um, so yet again, interpret these results with caution. Um, Still births, again, interpret with caution, but they saw an increase in individuals using marijuana and you saw an increased risk of uh, NICU admissions. Um, so the, what they, when they look at the studies, they, they believe concurrent tobacco use is an important mediator for some of the adverse pregnancy outcomes. So what about infants exposed? Um, with um, in utero to cannabis. So there's limitations to the data on cannabis use during pregnancy. Um, a lot of the individuals who do continue to use cannabis during their pregnancy are classically heavy polysubstance use abusers. So they're abusing other things, tobacco, alcohol, um, illicit substances. They also have lifestyle issues um, and adverse socioeconomic conditions. So you can see a higher risk of poverty and malnutrition in these individuals. Marijuana smoke also contains some of the same many of the same respiratory disease carcinogen toxins as tobacco smoke, and often in concentrations greater than tobacco smoke. Children who are expo exposed in, to marijuana in utero, you see lower scores, scores on tests of visual problem solving, difficulty with visual and motor coordination, visual analysis, and you also have a decreased attention span and behavioral problems. They also found during many other studies that marijuana users were less likely to supplement with folic acid during their pregnancy. And folic acid is really important during the first trimester, during your whole pregnancy, but especially the first trimester on developing that CNS, that, um, that system. So we really need to focus on um, supplementing their folic acid. So what about opiate use during pregnancy? So the National Survey of Drug Use and Health showed that the past month opioid misuse decreased from 0.9% in 2018 to 0.4% in 2019 in pregnant women. So in the 18 to 25 year olds, we saw an increase from 0.5% to 0.9%, but in the 26 to 44 year olds, it did decrease from 1.1% to 0.2%. Um, so that's a huge decrease in the older population that are um, that are um, pregnant. In the first trimester, we did see a, a huge drop from 2.6% to 0.5% in women abusing opiates. Second trimester in 2018, it was unavailable, but they were able to mark it in 2019 and it was at 0.5%. And in the third trimester, it dropped from 0.2% to 0.1%. So it was pretty low in the third trimester to begin with. So yet again, we see that as they progress in their pregnancy and we are able to get them into treatment, we see them using less substances. So what are the maternal risks of opiate use disorder in pregnancy? So we see, uh, you can see overdoses for the mom and, and baby. You can see um, infectious diseases are more common in, for the mom. So you can see HIV, you can see hepatitis B, hepatitis C. You see a lot of infections, cellulitis, endocarditis, um, any type of skin infections, abscesses. In these women, you see a lot of psychosocial challenges that occur with opiate use. So you have a higher risk of individuals um, in prostitution who are using um, in order to use, they are putting themselves at risk. You see a higher incidence of them in being involved in the criminal justice system with theft. Um, you see a higher risk of them being involved in violence in general, and that includes domestic violence um, with their partners. You see a higher risk of them being incarcerated. And what you can see is a poor engagement in their prenatal care. Um, they're very hesitant to seek treatment because of all the, the fear of, you know, if I go into treatment, is, is CPS going to take my baby? Am I going to be in trouble? The legal consequences, they're worried. Um, they, they face more legal consequences um, <clears throat> and they're they are fearful of that. Um, they have a higher risk of sexually transmitted infections. So that includes gonorrhea, chlamydia, um, trichomonas, things like that. The fetal risk um, for opiate dependence for the during pregnancy includes fetal hypoxia, which is low oxygen levels for the fetus, and includes a fetal growth restriction. 
So it also, which is where the baby can't grow as well, that placental abruption where the uterus rips away from the, uh, where the placenta rips away from the uterus, you have a higher incidence of fetal death and you have an increase of intrauterine aspiration of meconium. So meconium is the, is the first kind of bowel movement of the infant and you'll see higher, higher incidence of aspiration, which requires more NICU stays. Um, they believe that all of these fetal risks are related to the cycles of maternal withdrawal and withdrawal and intoxication. So to explain that more, we can kind of look at what opiate use looks like in, in an individual who's pregnant. Um, so when I talk about maternal withdrawal and intoxication, if someone was to use heroin at zero at hour zero, when we're looking at this, you see this big spike up, this peak where they have opiate intoxication and then as the heroin or oxycodone or hydrocodone levels decrease at hour six, all of a sudden mom goes into opioid withdrawal. When mom goes into opioid withdrawal, baby also goes into opioid withdrawal. So all of a sudden every six hours, you see yet again that peak where mom's intoxicated and goes into withdrawal. So baby is withdrawing you know, four to five times a day. So when mom's withdrawing, baby's withdrawing. So the goal is when we put them into treatment for opioid dependence, uh, we typically, this is the only one that goes on maintenance therapy or medication for their treatment. For all the other ones, um, for example, alcohol, we don't put them on any type of maintenance therapy. Tobacco, we do, we put them on, um, do we use patches for them for smoking cessation, but marijuana, there's no um, treatment for that um, for maintenance medication and same for um, alcohol. So what we wanna do is place them on a long acting opioid. And that's when you see this yellow line that's straight. So when they're on methadone or when they're on buprenorphine, you get this nice steady level. So baby's not going through withdrawal every four to six hours because mom is going into withdrawal. So the goal of putting them on this medication is to get them to stop using or to put them on medication during their pregnancy while they're abusing opiates is to get them to stop using and also to get this nice even level for baby. So the two medications we use are methadone and buprenorphine. So methadone is an opioid receptor agonist, um, which means it binds to all the opiate receptors and activates them. The goal is it to suppress opioid withdrawal for 24 to 36 hours without causing sedate, sedation or intoxication. It's a category C or a schedule two. It blocks withdrawal symptoms, cravings, and the reinforcing effects of opioids. So it requires three to six months to achieve stability. So when we talk about initiating methadone in a pregnant patient versus a non-pregnant patient, we initiate the same way. Dosing becomes um, different between a pregnant and non-pregnant patient, typically in the end of the second and through the third trimester. And I'm gonna talk about that more in the next slide. But regardless if they're pregnant or not, it does require that three to six months to achieve stability. You have to start low and go slow. And this is with any, any time you start methadone. So the most common time to overdose is in the first two weeks of treatment. So you can typically starting doses are anywhere between 20 to 40 milligrams. And then you do dose adjustments in five to 10 milligram increments every three to seven days. And then day, typically it's daily dosing. But then for pregnant women, it's a little bit different. And I'm gonna talk about why that is. And then average dose is typically anywhere from 80 to 150 milligrams. So why do we need to start, pre start pregnant women and non-pregnant women um, at the same levels or why does it take so long for them to achieve stability? So there's something called a steady state and there's four to five half times that we need to focus on. So as someone doses on methadone, that's the blue line, those peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs. So you dose on methadone at 30 milligrams on day, day zero, day one, day two, day three, you can kind of see that level going up. And the goal is to maintain and have that steady state or that even level with the black line. So as they go up, if you notice between day three, four, five, they start to level out. Well, if you were to continue and you started someone at day zero, 30 milligrams, then you went up on day the next day to 40 milligrams and the next day to five, you're gonna to continue to go up, up and up. And that's where the highest risk of overdose occurs in that first two weeks. If you go up too quickly, that level will be completely knocked up. So typically what they are on day, the, the first day of dosing is not what they are on the last or on the um, 
like day four or five of dosing. So they might say they're having withdrawal on day, day one after their first dose, but then on day four, they could be over sedated. So really we don't wanna do increases every day, typically only I know between days three, four or five or any time after that. Um, inpatient, when they come inpatient for treatment, we have a little bit more flexibility with dosing, um, but it, it should still remain the same where it takes some time to achieve that um, steady state. So that's why sometimes it takes individuals on methadone a longer time to stop using than it does on buprenorphine because buprenorphine is metabolized a little bit differently. So methadone dosing in pregnancy. So this is in the, usually typically in the end of the second and the third trimester, we consider split dosing in pregnancy. So moms um, who are pregnant, they typically metabolize methadone at a much more rapid rate. Um, so the half-life of methadone can decrease from that 22, 24 hours in non-pregnant women to eight hours in pregnant women. So a lot of times we'll, we'll split their dose, meaning we'll give part in the morning and part in the evening. Um, so I typically start 70% of their dose in the morning and 30% in the evening, and then adjust based on their withdrawal symptoms once they're stable. Um, the reason the half-life of the methadone does decrease is there's increased maternal weight. You have an increased intravascular volume. So um, just more volume because mom's carrying baby. You have an increased hepatic clearance and renal elimination. So you have an increased like um, metabolism through that liver, through that cytochrome P450 pathway and increased uh, elimination through the kidneys. And you have decreased protein binding, which actually increases methadone or uh, decreases methadone levels. Um, one thing to note is a lot of pregnant patients, um, one of the things they say when they first start methadone is they want to stay lower on their dose because they, they don't want baby to, because baby will go through neonatal abstinence syndrome um, at birth. Um, they want to say stay on their do low dose or a lower dose so they don't experience any of that and baby can go home with them. Well, the dosage actually doesn't determine the severity of neonatal abstinence syndrome because really we don't know how much mom's metabolizing because every mom's a little bit different. So I've had moms who delivered at 40 milligrams and baby was in the hospital for three weeks. And I've had women who have delivered at 120 milligrams and baby came home on day five. So there's no, um, the dosage doesn't determine the severity that baby's going to withdraw. And it's important to explain that to mom because we want mom to be stable on her methadone dose so she can stop using illicit substances, the opioids. So what are the pros of being on methadone for a pregnant female? You have this structured recovery environment. You have the medication and therapy at the same place. Um, there's typically more frequent monitoring on methadone. So they have to go to a place, an opioid treatment program that's a licensed program through the state. Um, so they come in every single data dose so we can do those evaluations more consistently. They have a decrease in the risk of inter, inter um, venous disease associated risk. So hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, you have a decrease in criminal activity, decreased overdose risk. Um, we see improved family stability, improved pregnancy outcomes. Um, methadone in pregnancy has a long track record of efficacy and safety. Um, we've been using it for quite a long time, since the 70s, 80s, and um, all the moms typically do really well on it. We see a reduction in other drug use. Um, the goal is to allow the mom also to be maintained on methadone to function normally at work or home. We wanna reduce her risk of relapse and there's no evidence of harm with long-term use. So how do we choose what patient is gonna go on methadone versus um, buprenorphine if they're abusing opioids? Any type, um, we look at their addiction, substance use disorder history with opioids, and if they've had multiple previous failed attempts at, at buprenorphine treatment, they might be a better candidate for methadone. Um, I will say that there is a big overlap of individuals who can be treated with methadone and buprenorphine. So you have to look at their whole history, what they're more likely to take and, and stick with as far as a treatment program goes. Um, there's more available data on the long-term um, developmental and behavioral outcomes on, on infants on methadone. Um, they have to have access to a methadone treatment center. That's really important. Um, if, if you're starting an individual on methadone on an inpatient unit who's pregnant, who, for example, is from the Upper Peninsula, where currently they don't have any methadone programs, you have to think about where you're going to send that pregnant mom back to after she does her two to three weeks um, inpatient for detoxification and residential. Um, so you really have to focus that they don't have a place to go. So if they were initiated and they tried to go back home at, to Marquette, 
The closest um, methadone programs are in Gaylord, Michigan, or are in Wisconsin, right over the border of the Upper Peninsula. So you end up having to set them up at one of those two, and they either have to travel to Wisconsin every year or down to Gaylord, but that's not reasonable. So typically they have to relocate where they live if you start them on methadone. One thing I will note is starting um, in the next one to two months, we are opening a methadone program in St. Ignace, um, right over the bridge in the U Upper Peninsula. So that'll be the first methadone program. So um, that we can take into account too when we're prescribing now is that we'll have access to a center up there for the first time ever. Um, and so daily oversight, individuals um, who are poly substance abuse typically do better on methadone. And um, that's, you know, with the methadone treatment center, again, getting those special licenses and being able to come in daily to dose are, you know, very important. Um, they have, if they have limited social support and family interaction, they might do better in a methadone treatment center because they're coming in more often and they've got, um, you know, we have therapy and medication on the same place so we can see them every day. We see a lower, so we're gonna talk about something called the mother study and with methadone, there's actually a lower dropout rate um, by 18% relative to individuals maintained on buprenorphine where there's a 33% dropout rate. And I'm gonna talk about the mother study because it was one of the big studies done that compared methadone to buprenorphine um, in moms. But the, one of the positives from methadone was the lower dropout rate compared to um, buprenorphine, um, which is, you know, Suboxone. So what about buprenorphine? It's a partial opioid agonist, so you see less opioid activity. It's got a slow onset and long duration of action of blocking. So the duration can be up to 72 hours. Classically, we see 24 to 36 though. Um, it can be dosed out of an office-based setting um, or an OTP, which is the opioid treatment programs. And the goal is to provide the pregnant mom with buprenorphine um, at a primary care practice setting or even you know an OBGYN as opposed to having to create these specialized clinics. So my, if the OB, their obstetrician prescribes um, buprenorphine, then go back to their obstetrician or if their primary care practice does, that opens up more doors and more options for treatment. Um, one thing I note is um, buprenorphine versus buprenorphine naloxone. So what is that? Buprenorphine without naloxone is Subutex and buprenorphine naloxone is, a, is Suboxone, the combination. Um, you know, about 10 years ago, initially, we would say you could only use Subutex, the mono product, the plain buprenorphine, because we wanted to give pregnant moms less medication. So why get them the naloxone? Well, it's been studied over the years and SAMHSA has come forward and said, and this is about eight, nine years ago, that buprenorphine naloxone is completely fine and safe. And there's some studies that showed actually moms on the buprenorphine naloxone, um, product, the Suboxone did better than individuals on the Subutex. And that's important because really we don't want to write a lot of Subutex because it has a higher um, diversionary rate on the street. So more people are more likely to divert it. It has higher street value. Um, as opposed to buprenorphine, you if you injected buprenorphine, you would get effects, but buprenorphine naloxone, the naloxone takes over on injection, so they are narcating themselves. So we wanna decrease the street value and also do what's safest for mom. But so we are using Suboxone. Average daily dosing is 16 milligrams, and it's got a, a little bit of a favorable safety profile compared to methadone. You see less respiratory depression um, at the initiation and maintenance. So buprenorphine has a ceiling effect. Um, so what does that mean? It means going up on higher doses, we don't really see any um, we don't really see any changes in treatment. So, so opioid receptor availability decreases with increasing doses of buprenorphine. So if you look at the MRI scans, um, this is looking at the binding potential. So where can buprenorphine bind the opioid receptor availability? So the green areas are where opioid receptors are available to be bound. So at zero, you see all this green. Then at two milligrams, you see less green and then 16 and 32 almost like in, indistinguishable. And when you look at the levels, you'll see two milligrams binds to 27 to 47%. Then you increase to 16 and you have 85 to 92% of your opioid receptors bound on buprenorphine. Whereas 32 milligrams, you have 94 to 98% of your receptors bound. So going up higher than, um, you know, you know, 16 to 24, we don't really do. Um, usually we level out about 16 milligrams. Um, the higher doses you get, the more potential you have for diversion of the medication. And no maintenance um, benefits typically above 32 milligrams. This is important because um, in pregnant patients where you see methadone going up 
as, as they progress in their pregnancy, they have to go to higher doses of methadone. We don't really see that in the buprenorphine or suboxone maintained um, pregnant moms. They don't have to go continue to go up in that dose. Um, the other thing is we also are able to stabilize buprenorphine patients a little bit quicker. So as opposed to methadone where it takes, you know, three up to three, three months to stabilize on a decent dosage, um, buprenorphine can stabilize typically within a week or so on the medication. But for treatment selection, how do we decide? You need to have access to a, a buprenorphine wavered physician or um, physician assistant or nurse practitioner. You have to have access to a counseling center. Um, typically we see a, if they have a moderate level of social support available, they do a little bit um, better. Yet again, um, less dose adjustments during that third trimester. Um, you can have office-based treatment. So it can be, instead of being written out of that OTP, they, they, you know, they have more options for treatment. Um, individuals with multiple medical comorbidities, we do see decreased drug-drug interactions with buprenorphine, so this might be a better option for them. And the mother study, which I'm going to talk about, has less neonatal abstinence syndrome or neonatal opiate withdrawal syndromes, so you see um, shorter hospital stays for the neonate. So the mother study, which is the Maternal Opioid Human Experimental Research Study, was a double-blinded randomized controlled study test uh, that occurred at eight international sites of 175 uh, pregnant women. It was done by Jones in 2010, and it compared methadone and buprenorphine. And what it showed were both were effective at preventing relapse to illicit opiate use. And there was no significant di difference in overall rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome in, the, um, in them, but they did show a higher dropout rate with buprenorphine, so 33% versus methadone, which was 18%. So when I say no significant difference in overall rates, so almost every infant over 90% plus will go through neonatal neonatal abstinence syndrome at birth with opioid. So the rates weren't changed, you know, if you're whether in buprenorphine or methadone, baby will go through some withdrawal. But what the mother study showed was that the buprenorphine rate had less severity to their neonatal abstinence syndrome among the neonates. So even though um, it's going to occur one way or another, there was less severity in the buprenorphine group. So they, the buprenorphine group had 89% less morphine for their symptoms of um, withdrawal. They had 43% shorter hospital stays, and they had a 58% shorter duration of treatment for that neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, so that was significant, but there was a higher dropout rate um, for this. So you kind of got to weigh the risks and the benefits of which medication is going to be better for which patient. Naltrexone, I bring this up only because I get asked this a lot, is um, why not naltrexone since it's not an opioid and then baby doesn't have to go through neonatal absence syndrome. Um, so how does naltrexone work? That's Vivitrol. It's a once monthly injection. Um, it's an opiate antagonist. So it binds to that opiate receptor and has complete blockade. So the benefits are, you're right, the baby, there's no risk of neonatal abstinence syndrome to the baby. And you don't actually need a special license to prescribe this medication. Um, the risks, long-term effects on fetal development due to blockade of opiate receptors is not well known. So there hasn't been much study on this um, because typically with a medication, we don't you know, automatically want to give it to a pregnant patient without um, more research. Animal studies, though, have shown developmental and behavioral changes in adult rats exposed to naltrexone utero, but the human studies on developmental and behavioral sequelae are lacking. So more research, but it does require detoxification from opioids to start. Um, and that's concerning because if they need to go, you know, five to six days without using opioids, it's very difficult for them to, you know, initiate. And then once they initiate, it's, it's hard for them to continue. We do see, so they did do studies with Wall in 2013 that showed higher rates of relapse or dropout from treatment on individuals they attempted to maintain on naltrexone. Pretty much all in all, the studies that they continued to do, found, they were found to be Naltrexone was found to be inferior in effectiveness over the pharmacotherapy with an opioid agonist, um, which is your methadone or buprenorphine in your pregnant patients. We also are concerned about possible complications for pain management at delivery. So because naltrexone is an opiate antagonist, um, if we were trying to give them an opioid at delivery, if they had a C-section like um, if we were trying to give them hydrocodone after delivery, it wouldn't work if they had naltrexone on board. So there are, there are some complications at delivery for the pregnant mom if someone was to try to can maintain them on naltrexone. Okay, 
So what are the benefits to treatment? So methadone maintenance and buprenorphine have shown to be an effective choice um, in pregnancy. We do encourage breastfeeding um, after delivery when you're on medications for opiate use disorder. Uh, one thing is going to treatment, it removes the mother from their poor environment and will have improved access to comprehensive uh, prenatal care. So once an individual enters treatment, they're more likely to be connected with prenatal care. You see impre improved maternal nutrition, you see impro improvement in maternal fetal outcomes, it increases the birth weight of the baby. Um, which is important. You have an increased psychosocial support and you have a decrease in polysubstance abuse. So the question I always get asked is, should women um, attempt to undergo a detoxification? So you can absolutely do it. Opiate detoxification can be accomplished safely during pregnancy. Um, they ran two studies that showed it was, um, was more able to accomplish it safely. I've done it myself. So um, but very few, the issue that comes into it is very few women who will who go through complete detoxification and attempt to remain abstinent, most will relapse. Um, it showed 80 to 90%, and it's similar to non-pregnant patients in the relapse potential of that 80 to 90%. But when we think about pregnant patients, we are concerned about the infant too. So we don't wanna put mom at risk. So it's very rare that I do that. Um, if a mom's using maybe four Norcos a day or hydrocodones a day, um, that might be a one, and she's never attempted detoxification in the past, that might be one I would try to do if she wanted to go abstinent based. Um, that would be a good candidate potentially, as long as she had, you know, a lot of psychosocial support to help her, um, she was able to engage in therapy. But um, classically, most individuals go on maintenance and that's the current recommendation. What about infants that are exposed in utero to uh, opioids? Um, data on long-term outcomes in infants in, within utero opioid exposure is limited, but earlier studies have not found significant differences in cognitive development between children up to five years of age exposed to methadone in utero and control groups match for age, race, and socioeconomic status. Um, preventative interventions focus, focusing on enriching early experiences of such children and improving quality um, of, at, of at home environments are likely to be beneficial. So things like doing a referral to early on um, has found to be um, preventative intervention um, for individuals exposed in utero. So what about neonatal absence syndrome or opioid withdrawal syndrome? So the disorder is characterized by behavioral and psychological signs and symptoms from opioid withdrawal, um, occurs in 60 to 90% of the infants exposed to opiates in utero. It usually begins at 24 to 96 hours um, after birth. So a lot of times when moms ask how long they have to stay in the hospital, um, they might be able to leave most of the time before their child will. There's a mandatory stay for infants of up to 96 hours after birth. So things um, that mom needs to think about is that transportation of going to visit her baby at the hospital if baby's um, in the NICU. Um, things like if they are breastfeeding, um, they're going to need to pump at home and bring that breast milk in. So those are things mom needs to think about um, that there's that mandatory stay and it might be longer because of withdrawal. Um, severity can be measured by a Finnegan score, which is their neonatal withdrawal scoring symptoms. Um, some people have moved away from Finnegan scoring to the eat sleep um, console model. So that's been shown to be beneficial too. Um, but the benefit of treatment always outweighs the benefit of risk. If we can get mom sober and doing well, that's really what we wanna focus on because then we'll have a better outcome with baby. So what does neonatal absence syndrome look like? So I'm gonna talk in generalized terms of this now because neonatal absence syndrome is a little bit different than now. Now it's just opioid, but absence syndrome affects, so that could be, a, a you know, baby withdrawing from alcohol, benzos. We see this in all the infants with, during withdrawal. You have CNS effects, so irritability, hypertonia, which is kind of a tightness. They are, they have increased muscle tone, so they have hyperreflexia. They have an abnormal suck and they can have poor feeding. And about one to 3% of the infants experience seizures. The GI effects include diarrhea and vomiting. Some of the respiratory effects, tachypnea, which is they breathe really, really fast. Um, you'll see sneezing, um, yawning, lacrimation, which is um, like tearing at the eyes, sometimes sweating and a slight increase in temperature. Um, you can see delayed effects on the infant for up to four to six months after delivery. So what do we see for neonatal abstinence syndrome in Michigan? from 2010 to 2019. So you saw, per, and this is per 100,000 births, pretty much between 2013 and 2017, you kind of saw this flat where it was pretty high. And then in 2018, it dipped. And again, in 2019 to 623 
births um, per 100,000 live births. And this is according to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services vital records on health, health statistics. Um, so hopefully 2020 comes out next year and we get to see what happened during the coronavirus pandemic. But we did see a decrease in neonatal absence syndrome in the last um, 2018 and 2019. So what do rates look like when you're looking at the counties? So the rate of neonatal absence syndrome of Michigan infants has decreased from 718 in 2018 per 100,000 and it went down to 623 births per 100,000 births in 2019. When you look at it county-based, um, what you'll see is the highest rates of neonatal absence syndrome were in the northern portion of the lower peninsula and in the upper Pernor portion of the, or in the upper peninsula. So part of it is they have decreased substance use sort of facilities in the upper peninsula. So hopefully by um, increasing the number of treatment centers in the UP in Northern Michigan, we can start to see those rates come down. Um, neonatal absence syndrome infants, they typically have longer hospital stays so they can cost nearly 2 billion nationally um, for treatment. So yet again, um, by race and ethnicity, where, where does neonatal absence syndrome fall? You see um, an increase in the American Indian, again, um, that's per 100,000 live births. The American Indian compared to the other ones, they had 4,473 um, births per 100,000 live births. So they by far out, out, um, outdid any of the other by race and ethnicity for those, um, compared to those moms. So one thing that's, when you look at the map of Michigan, you notice like the northern counties and the UP have the highest rates, but that's also if you look at um, where the federal American Indian um, locations are, where the, where the tribes are located, they're all located in northern Michigan and the UP. So if you kind of compare that they have less access to treatment in the northern areas and they have increased risk of neonatal abstinence syndrome, um, they kind of go together. And that's probably why you see that really big uptick in neonatal abstinence syndrome in the Native American. Okay, so what about access to treatment for pregnant women? So facilities that offer special programs for pregnant or postpartum women. So we pretty much are similar to national numbers. So total nationally is 22.4%. In Michigan, it's 21.3%. We have 97 facilities. But then if you look at things that cause barriers to moms coming in for treatment, you know, one of them being childcare, that's when it really dips. Yet again, we are on the national average, but it starts, the numbers look low. So it's 6.4% um, nationally, but 6.6% in Michigan, we have 30 centers that will offer child care, that will offer child care for clients and treatment. Now it even dips farther if those, so if mom has to go into treatment and has other children, how does she do that if she doesn't have any psychosocial support or anyone to help her care for that second, for the, her other child, um, so that she can get treatment for while she's pregnant. Um, so those that offer residential beds where the, where the client or the patient's child can come in to treatment with them, that dips even further. Nationally, it's 2.8%. In Michigan, it's 2.9%. There's 13 facilities in Michigan that offer some type of residential bed for a client. And if you look at detoxification bed, it even dips down more. So one of the key, or what are the key considerations um, for pregnant patients? during treatment. So one of, we wanna provide community-based support systems to meet the unique needs of women with substance use disorder. So we wanna facilitate access to support groups. So in, in our community, what Sacred Heart has done is we partnered with um, two of the local hospitals that are um, near our outpatient, some of our outpatient centers, specifically Henry Ford McComb and Hurley Hospital. And we started offering a program called Hopeful Hearts. Um, Pre-COVID, it was a, it was a little, it wasn't, it's been virtual since COVID um, because now the moms aren't allowed in the hospital until um, they go to deliver or if they have an appointment. So pre-COVID or prior to coronavirus pandemic, Hopeful Hearts, the mom would be able to come into the hospital. So if they were going to deliver at Henry Ford McComb or Hurley, or even if they weren't delivering and they just wanted more education on being on specifically, and this was for opioids, being on methadone or buprenorphine during their treatment, they would be able to come into this support group. And they would able, so it was a presentation and um, our, we had our social workers from our centers that would be available so they could answer any questions. 
So the goal was to reduce their fear of interactions with CPS and then to know and have these spaces in front of them that they'll see when they come to deliver because moms are always really afraid to come in and deliver at the hospital. They're, they're afraid they'll be shamed or made to feel guilty for doing this maintenance. So by being able to see some of the other team outside of their OB and their treatment centers, like where they're gonna actually deliver. So they get to meet um, you know, the, C the social worker who's gonna work with them at their CPS involvement. Then next they get to meet with the neonatal intensive care unit um, nurses and the OB nurses. They come up and they do a presentation and we talk about withdrawal, what to expect at the hospital, visitation, um, things like that. And um, I think it's really beneficial for mom to get to meet and do those space. And they can ask any questions about delivery and what they can anticipate at delivery. And then after that, the lactation consultant, we would discuss breastfeeding um, during pregnancy. And then we would move on to early on doing presentations. So even talking about postpartum after they deliver, you know, what, what, what are the expectations? What are their services are available? So mom being able to put faces and names and meet people beforehand kind of makes them feel a little bit better when they come in to deliver. Um, they're less nervous. They've, they've got to meet everyone. And I think working with the hospital systems it does reduce some of the stigma that maybe some of the nursing staff might ex experience um, with those maintained on methadone or suboxone during the duration of their pregnancy. Since the coronavirus pandemic um, happened, we are still offering the Hope Hearts program. It's not on site at the hospital anymore, though. So we offer it at our community centers. You do not have to be um, actually being in treatment at our center. You can be at the other center to come in. Um, but you'll come in and it's a virtual presentation where, for example, we had one yesterday, I was on the line along with the um, OB nurses, um, social worker, Dr. Block, the neonatologist, and we answer any questions of all the pregnant moms that join us virtually from any of the sites. Um, so that can be, if we can facilitate access to support groups like that, it can help um, mom want to be in treatment and stay in treatment and have less um, nervousness about delivery. Um, providing childcare and residential and outpatient settings to alleviate those challenges of parenting while in treatment. So you really need to look at um, how many facilities, if there's, if we're able to, you know, start to increase in the state of Michigan facilities that offer childcare and residential beds, that would be very beneficial. Um, we want to work with housing. Uh, with providing them with housing, family strengthening programs. We need to look at employment services for mom um, while she's in the pro while she's in the community. So how do we we want to implement? How do we do this? A workforce and other strategies that can increase access to the substance use disorder treatment in the rural areas. So we want to implement changes to provider licensing, expanding access through telehealth. So if mom's able to do any type of um, maintenance through telehealth. Um, you know, from, because you're able to write suboxone or buprenorphine to telehealth and some individual going back to a part of the UP where there's not a licensed provider for buprenorphine, they're still able to get their medication via telehealth. Um, so that's really important. And then offering more treatment facilities, specifically, um, you know, we'll, Sacred Heart will be offering methadone in the UP and it'll be the first clinic there. So that should help hopefully open um, up more treatment facilities and decrease the risk of individuals not being able to continue with their treatment. We want to leverage our peer support specialists um, during treatment. I find them to be in a, a great situation to engage our pregnant patients and um, encourage them to stay in treatment and make all their appointments. I think that's really um, an important thing. I think incorporating transportation benefits into substance use disorder programming is important. So now, you know, a mom is pregnant, but then she delivers. How does she get from, you know, maybe Another patient was giving her a ride up to the treatment, but now she's got an infant she's got to care for where she maybe has to come up to, and get treatment and do her follow-up. She's got to transport that infant too. And, you know, so we need to look at how we can transport that infant safely um, and help mom get more rides for that infant. So we need to educate providers and patients to reduce stigma association, associated with pregnant and parenting women accessing substance use disorder treatments. So a lot of pregnant women are reluctant to seek um, substance use disorder services. They fear criminal justice involvement or child welfare involvement. Um, that's a really huge fear. So if we can educate patients to understand that just because child welfare gets involved or CPS, that it doesn't mean that the infant's gonna be removed. It's just them working for you to, you know, encourage you to stay in treatment and make sure that the infant, once they're delivered, has, an, has everything they need at home for them. Um, they might be less, re less reluctant and less scared um, to seek substance use disorder services. 
Um, there's a stigma from the provider community still, and it can lead to discrimination and further discourage women from receiving care. Um, so individuals, you know, when they're pregnant, they, you know, all of a sudden they they realize they're drinking too much, and they're really the stigma that their provider might put on them for drinking while they're pregnant might actually prevent them from seeking care. So if we can educate the community at large that, you know, seeking treatment is the right thing and we won't judge you, you know, they might be less likely not to seek treatment. Um, there continues to be a stigma surrounding medications for opiate use disorder for pregnant women. So individuals who are abusing opioids, um, despite the evidence of improved fe maternal fetal outcomes, there's still this huge stigma of being on this me medication maintenance during their pregnancy. They so I think education is a key component of that for our providers. Um, a lot of them are concerned even to go into, you know, to the prenatal care and say, you know, to their obstetrician who's going to tell them hopefully that it's okay for them to be on this as long, you know, because it's helping them remain sober, sober and do better. Um, so more education and training is the key to reduce the stigma. So we need to coordinate and align healthcare and child welfare policies. So we want to promote coordination between ch child welfare professionals through cross-system collaboration. So making sure that when we're, when we're looking at the mom and we're focusing on her delivery, what's going to happen at delivery, making sure we have releases signed. So once the mom goes ahead and delivers, we're able to talk to CPS, talk about their treatment so that they know if they're doing well in treatment and if they have any concerns about baby going home. So we want to promote that coordination through that cross-system um, collaboration. We want to collaborate to align substance use or treatment timelines with child welfare timelines. That's important because I think CPS has a stigma too about the medication and they assume that once mom goes ahead and delivers that she should be off the medication immediately and that's not accurate at all. Um, I've gotten letters where they tell me mom's on methadone or buprenorphine and mom has to be off in two months and period or else she might lose um, you might lose um, custody, things like that. So then we have to work with CPS to educate them. And that's not the correct timeline. So I think education of CPS on treatment timelines, and so their timelines match up with our timelines is a, is a definite need to see more of that. We need to involve parenting women who are in long-term recovery in the design and implementation of substance use disorder policies, policies and programs. So um, parenting women in long-term recovery, they do provide valuable insight into how to structure these programs to effectively meet the needs, needs of our individuals um, who are pregnant and or attempting to parent with um, substance use disorder. Um, we, they can engage these women based on their own life experiences. So they can, you know, I think that's, especially where the peer recovery coaches, you know, if we talk about employment issues, maybe this might be a good employment opportunity for this individual to look at getting their certification in that. We need to engage and train women in recovery as peer support specialists to help others navigate the SUD services and community support. So I think those are all key components in um, getting pregnant women into treatment and how do we keep them in treatment and how do we engage them more and how do we continue to work with them so that they have a better outcome for, um, we see a better outcome for mom and for baby. Okay, we had a question in the chat that says, is there a specific phone number if we wanna refer someone to the Helpful Heart Program? So what I, all you need to do is contact Sacred Heart and we can let them know the date and time. It's every, um, every it's once a month, every Wednesday from one to two. And we offer it at our St. Clair Shores location, our Madison Heights location and our Flint location. So I would say if you reach out to any of those locations or the one that you want to refer to so that we know that they're coming in and we can make sure that um, they're set up, um, that I would say that call one of those sites directly and they can set you up. Thanks. And then the other, the other question that was in the chat is just, um, can the PowerPoints be emailed? And yes, we can email out the PowerPoints to the participants and then for anyone, um, we'll try to also include the link to the survey. A couple of people have mentioned that it didn't um, pop up after their webinar. So if that happens to you, do not worry. We will get that out to you via email as well. I just want to thank you, Dr. Omnick, for your time today and for your expertise. And thanks to everyone else who attended today. So today's presentation was one of many webinars scheduled throughout the month of September, and you can still register for any upcoming sessions at sccmh.org.
At the conclusion, like we said, a pop-up will come up on your screen. Please take a moment and fill out the survey, especially if you've registered to get those continuing education credits. Thanks again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you all at the next webinar.